Even a month after Golden State took home its fourth chip in eight seasons, it's still well worth looking back and breaking down how the Warriors took care of business against all the odds. The narrative about the Dubs' finals opponent in the Boston Celtics was all about how they had the best second half of the season record of all time for a team that was under 500 prior to it. What everyone forgot about was how before the playoffs, Curry missed the final 12 games of the regular season with a left foot sprain, an injury which Steph ended up re-aggravating down the line in the finals, but inspirationally fought through. Making the Warriors title run even more unpredictable than the health status of the chef was how terrible the dubs were playing down the stretch of the 82 game grind. Over the final three months of the regular season since February 9th, the dubs looked like the L's entering the postseason, finishing the campaign 12 and 16, even at one point having a league worst resembling record of 7 and 16 over that span. The dynasty's core led by Steph, Clay, and Dre flipped the switch when it mattered most, but before they did, here's how they deceived us all. Before continuing, according to YouTube's analytics, only 14.8% of you watching right now are subscribed, so press the box and turn on notifications if you haven't already. Also leave a like on this video, it takes a few seconds and makes a massive difference. Make sure you're following me on Instagram at Hoops. Now into the content. Whether it was a CBS reporter calling Jordan Poole the worst pick in 2019's draft, Nick Wright saying Andrew Wiggins is a bad basketball player when the Warriors acquired him, Kendrick Perkins and Dominique Foxworth saying Steph wouldn't win another championship, plus many other awful takes. The 2022 dubs forced the attention-seeking mainstream media to eat their words. Some of them, like Nick Wrong, even apologized. But before they proved the world dead wrong, the Warriors actually hit rock bottom on Wednesday, March 30th in a loss to the number one seeded Phoenix Suns, as over their last 23 games at that point, which is over a quarter of the NBA schedule, this L would give the dubs a measly 30% winning percentage over that stretch. That was a massive sample size where the Warriors were winning at a lower frequency than the 13th seeded Portland Trailblazers. Having lost Steph 13 days earlier, it was no surprise that Golden State was more than merely in desperate need of their best player's services back. There seemed to be legitimate issues in terms of the supporting cast sustaining their offensive flow and defensive consistency. Among all 30 teams from February 9th to March 30th, the Warriors ranked 22nd or worse in points per game, plus efficiency from both the field and from deep. Thankfully, they bounced back to win five straight games without Curry, which was followed by Steph's return for Game 1 of the Western Conference quarterfinals against the Denver Nuggets. Still, skeptics had concerns revolving around Steph and Curry's rust, and how fast the Warriors could gain a rhythm again without their number one option for such an extended period of time. There were even some bringing up the shooting slump that Steph went through during the year, prior to and after breaking the all-time three-point record. And then you had the casuals disrespecting Curry by saying that he was washed up, skepticism which turned into pure fuel for Steph, as he mapped out his revenge on the association when sitting out on the couch recovering from his aforementioned left foot sprain. That time off ended up being a blessing in disguise, as Curry looked like a new version of himself when he returned to say night-night to Denver, as the 34-year-old's fresh legs paid dividends. Ultimately, as the rounds progressed, Steph Curry was slowly but surely sweeping his shooting slump during the year, plus his previous injury, under the rug, while having one of the all-time greatest postseason runs in NBA history. Curry was most dominant on the very biggest stage, as even when the Warriors went down 2-1 to one to Boston, Steph's reaction on the bench during the final minutes of the loss displays he wasn't too concerned. Most amazing part about that confident reaction from Curry is that smile came in spite of his night ending early because of a re-aggravated ankle. Steph was dealing with the same bad foot which kept him out the final month of the 82-game season, yet came out the next outing in Boston, with the Dubs being on the verge of going down 3-1 to one, and scored 43 points on an unheard of true shooting mark considering where he shoots it from of 71.8%. Displaying how much of the weight he carried for Golden State, Steph became the first player of all time to average 30 points, 5 rebounds, 5 assists, and 5 threes in a final series. Putting that into perspective, at one point during Steph's shooting slump during the regular season, he had missed 70% of his last 135 three-pointers. That goes to show you how true superstars raise their games in the playoffs and know exactly when they're truly evaluated as players. Unfortunately, Dubs Nation is made up of around 50% Stephen Curry stands and 50% Draymond Green diehards, 
which leads to tension within the fanbase. For example, instead of appreciating the two-headed monster that Curry and Green are on the court, you have casuals hating on Draymond for hanging out with LeBron James in his spare time away from the court. Draymond Green's defense is almost as big of a factor to the Warriors' success as Stephen Curry's ability to carry the team offensively, which says a lot. Without getting things twisted though, as coach Steve Kerr and everyone in the Warriors organization is well aware of, there's no doubt the dynasty all starts and ends with Stephen Curry, who's the Warriors' best player by far, and if you don't believe that, while Green's the second most important player, in my opinion, to the Warriors' dynasty, his all-time record without Curry next to him is 33 wins and 62 losses. It's disrespectful that Draymond gets blasted for his lack of scoring though, because offensively, he does so much of the dirty work that goes unnoticed. Of course, he does that defensively as well and on the glass, but Green's criminally underrated passing chops, team most important screen setting, team best chemistry with Curry, and as I just said, undeniably valuable defensive awareness, make him a star within his role. Not to mention, Green's the guy who allows no one to mess with Stephen Curry, as the guy's toughness makes him the NBA's most intimidating enforcer. If you're still not sold on the impact of Green during the regular season, when Draymond was on the court, the Warriors had the best defensive efficiency in 18 years. Then in the playoffs, Green had a better net rating than Stephen Curry. Shout out Colin Cowherd on those last two stats. Third and debatably the second most important Warrior in their championship efforts is Andrew Wiggins, whose perimeter clamps on Jason Tatum in the finals plus 18.6 points per game average against Boston were decisive factors. The development of the former number one pick who was labeled a draft bust has been yet another deceiving, unpredictable element for analysts as the Canadian shockingly elevated into an all-star starter this past season after not just gaining trust, but a brotherhood with Klay Thompson, Draymond Green, and Stephen Curry, the still just 27-year-old Wiggs was meant to play in this Warrior organization as his two-way presence on the wing was exactly what Golden State had been needing since Kevin Durant's departure in 2019. Luckily, the summer KD decided to join the Nets was the same summer Bob Meyer selected the steal of that year's draft in Jordan Poole, whose 2021-22 campaign saw him start 51 of 76 games, filling in for either Thompson or Curry. When the Splash Brothers were both healthy, Deadpool showed flashes of being an elite spark plug off the bench. Sixth Man of the Year is an award JP should definitely be in the hunt for next season, but as Steve Kerr recently admitted, he often had to remind Jordan to be himself as opposed to trying to emulate the playing style of the greatest shooter of all time. Steve Kerr said this to the ringer back in May, quote, in his third year, his three point percentage isn't what Steph's is, so without trying to thwart him and keep him from being himself, I'm trying to nudge him toward really high percentage shots rather than emulating Steph. Kerr also spoke on where Poole is showing the biggest signs of progression, saying, where it's really showing is in his defense, it's been something we've been on him about all year, defending without fouling, really taking on the challenge of taking the best player, if the best player is coming at him, accept it and embrace it, if there's a switch, same thing, get in front of that guy, defend him as best you can without fouling, end quote. Those compliments from Kerr on Jordan's defense came after the first round against Denver, and on the topic of that first round matchup, it was a five-game gentleman sweep for the dubs in which Jordan Poole dominated in his first career playoff series, averaging 21 points on a ridiculous shooting split of 55% from the field, 48% from three on six deep range attempts per game, and 85% from the charity stripe. Jordan followed that up by scoring at least 20 points in each of the first three games of the second round against Memphis, then against the Mavericks in the conference finals, his shooting split was 64-40-100, and he contributed 16 points on average in that Dallas series. A separate video showing you how Jordan breaks down defenders off the dribble could definitely be put together, but in terms of his stats, most crucially in the NBA Finals versus Boston, in just 20 minutes per game, the Michigan product was a Sean Livingston-esque elite backup for Steph, posting a very solid 13 points each night on a shooting line of 44-39-91. His coach may want him to play like himself, which I definitely agree with wholeheartedly, but there's no doubt Poole shows flashes of Steph deep in his bag. In your opinion, any chance Jordan Poole can get to Steph's level? 
Best answer gets next video shout out and the top five commenters with the most shout outs by September 21st earn free merchandise of their choosing. Last video I asked who's better between Steph and Giannis. Today's speaks winner is Dylan Popoff who says this one is tough. You can go either way. I mean, without the other stars next to them, they were both unsuccessful in the playoffs, but that's basketball today. If I had to choose, I'd pick Curry because I like watching him more, but Giannis feels more dominant on the floor, I will say. This is by far the hardest question yet.